This is a game played by a young Bobby Fischer, arguably the greatest chess player in history, in 1956 against a Donald Byrne, a prominent master at the time and U.S. champion when Fischer was only 13 years old. It has been called the game of the century because of the beautiful sacrifices and combinations which led to mate which Fischer offered his older and more experienced opponent. Fischer is black and white opens with knight to f3, one of the standard opening moves. It brings a piece out in preparation for castling and the knight attacks the sweet center squares. As pieces move towards the center, their mobility and options increase. The battle for the center and space begins with the first moves in chess. Fischer also develops his knight for the same reasons, attacking e4, preventing the immediate push of the pawn. White continues with pawn to c4, also hitting the center. Black develops his g-pawn so the bishop can come out in preparation for castling. This is acceptable. The knight comes to c3, also moving towards the center, attacking the center squares. All of the pieces must come out to do battle. Fischer continues by developing his bishop, and now he's ready to castle. White plays the pawn to d4, also towards the center, attacking these squares, and Fischer castles. White continues and develops his bishop. Whenever your opponent moves, you must ask, what is the threat? What is he attacking? We see that the bishop is attacking this pawn now, once, and it's defended once. Fischer continues and plays pawn to d5, opening up the diagonal for the bishop so he can come out. And also the pawns now are attacking each other. The white pawn could capture and black could recapture with the knight and we'd have a series of trades. This is a possibility. Or the pawn can be defended. And that's what white chose to do by defending it with the queen. However, white has placed himself into a power move weakness here because the pawn can capture attacking the queen and that's what Fisher does and the queen recaptures and now again we have to ask is my opponent attacking anything what is the threat we see now that the queen is attacking the pawn it's being attacked twice now and only defended once by the queen and as the book mentions when a piece is attacked you can run you can defend you can try and block or take one of the attackers Fisher decides to move the target. White still needs to bring his bishop out so he can castle. He does have the option now of castling queenside, but he plays pawn to e4, also bring it towards the center. It's defended once by the knight and attacked by the black knight once. Fisher continues by developing another piece. He brings the knight out, he swings the knight out, and white slides the rook over towards the center, x-raying the queen. Do you see a power move that black can launch against white? Notice that the queen is in with, within reach of the knight, and you always want to try and achieve multiple goals simultaneously. The bishop still needs to come out, so Fisher attacks the queen. The queen has to run and now black develops the bishop creating power move number four, a pin against the knight because the rook is behind the knight. And now white continues and plays the bishop to g5 if you notice, he moved the same piece twice in the opening before castling, and that's generally not advisable because it gives your opponent a chance to develop more pieces, and he might be able to launch a gang attack. On every move, you should conduct a power move evaluation, beginning with a defensive one, and then an offensive one. And if we look here and see what power moves are available to black now, we'll look at some of the features that 
gave Bobby Fischer ideas for an attack, including sacrificial power moves. If you notice, the knight can take this pawn, attacking the queen and the bishop, although it is defended, that would be a sacrifice. And if you notice, the queen can be attacked by the knight here, which is also a sacrifice because the square is defended by this knight. However, that would remove the defender of this pawn. Things are already getting complicated tactically. Fisher launches his attack and goes after the queen and White decides to move, move the queen instead of capturing the knight. Black continues by capturing the knight himself and the pawn recaptures and now Black is free to capture this pawn which is what he does. And now notice that the this pawn is attacked twice, once by the queen and by this bishop and only defended once. So White captures the pawn, forking the rook and the queen. The queen runs and now White decides to develop his bishop because he realizes he's a little bit behind in development and needs to castle before he tries to capture the rook, which is worth more points than the bishop. When possible, you should try to prevent your opponent from castling, and that's what Fisher sets about to do here. He plays knight takes pawn, which is another uh, sacrifice, sacrificial offer, and white first attacks the queen, but this gives black a chance now to check the king. White decides to run, and now he can no longer castle. He could have tried to block here with the knight, but then the rook would go, and there were a lot of tactical possibilities here, so he decides to run instead. Notice that the black queen is still under attack by the bishop, but instead of moving his queen, Fisher makes one of the greatest sacrificial moves in chess history. He instead moves his bishop here, attacking this undefended bishop, which also prepares a check. So we have power move number three and a pre preparation for power move number one. White takes the queen, as most chess players would. But now the attack on the king begins, and black plays bishop takes bishop, check. The king runs. He can't run here because the rook is guarding this file. Do you see the next check? The knight can come here and check the king, which is what he does. Now the king can only come back, and he does. And now he's in line with the, with the bishop and he captures a pawn with the discovered check, so he starts to win back some of his material. The king has to run again, and the knight checks him again, bringing him back to the, the, the diagonal that the bishop is on. The knight swings back, we have another discovered check, now the knight is attacking the undefended rook. The king runs again, Notice that the knight is defended by the bishop. Take a moment and see if you can find another power move, an immediate one. Fisher plays, pawn takes bishop, attacking the queen. The queen has to run. Now she's attacking the undefended bishop, and the rook slides up and defends the bishop. The queen captures this undefended pawn. When pieces work together, they're very powerful. United we stand. This is a beautiful arrangement of pieces here, how they're each defending one another. And now, and now the knight captures the undefended rook. Even though black is doesn't have his queen, he's actually up in a force in a force count if you count the value of the pieces. And notice that the rook is out of play. It's as if white isn't even playing with this rook. 
rooks are worth five points, so we have five, ten. Bishops and knight are three, that's nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four points against whites. Queen, queens are nine, so this is nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and three is sixteen, and five is twenty-one. So black has more force than white and played well, he should be able to come out ahead. Of course this takes a lot of skill and experience and maybe a little genius as we'll see here. White knows he needs to get his rook out in order to help in the battle and he moves his pawn so his king can run and get the rook out. And now the plan is to knock off as many pawns or pieces as you can and then, maybe prom and then maybe promote a pawn to a queen. So black captures this undefended pawn with the rook and also has achieved this, the strategic goal of occupying the seventh rank with a rook. And white gets his king out and activates his rook finally. The knight is undefended, so he runs and simultaneously attacks the rook grabbing another pawn in the process. The knight is defended by this rook. The queen is attacking it, but it's defended. The white rook slides out and attacks the black rook, and black simply captures it. White throws in an intermediate move by checking the king. The bishop blocks the check, the only the only move and now white captures the rook and still black is way ahead in the force count the white squared black bishop is doing nothing not attacking anything and he's undefended so he moves to this square attacking this pawn although it's attacked I mean defended once by the knight The white knight moves in closer to the center so he can create some possible counterattacks against black. The black knight regroups, also moves towards the center to have more mobility. And now the queen slides here attacking the, I think, the only undefended black piece. Yes, everything else is defended and black moves it, one of the options, and the pawn is defended by this pawn, which is defended by the bishop. And again, if you see, all of black's pieces are working together, although the bishop is still pinned. White moves this pawn, maybe giving the king more escape squares, also providing a, a defense for the knight should he decide to swing in here. and black prevents its further push. That was another possibility of this pawn. And now the knight swings in here. Whenever your opponent moves, you have to ask, what is the threat? And you have to look two moves ahead. You have to, you have to look at the one-two combinations. And you see here, the bishop is still pinned, and it is, you know, it's attacked by the queen. If he could get another attacker in there, he could win the bishop. So you notice in another move, he could swing the knight here and have an attack on the bishop and win the bishop. Fisher sees this and moves the king up, getting the bishop out of the pin. This frees the bishop to move, and if you notice, you know, he's a dark squared bishop, and all of white's pieces are in line on this dark square, and the knight is defending this square, so in one move the bishop could come here forking the queen and the knight so white moves the king at least the king off off of that square but he exposes himself to power move number one check with the bishop all of black's pieces are are in reach of the king the king runs he doesn't want to get trapped here in the corner the knight could have swung in and checked him. 
The knight swings here instead and checks him here. Always look for the check and all the different ways of checking. The king runs. The bishop checks. Chasing the king, cornering him, removing his escape squares. The bishop checks him. This is a beautiful combination. The king runs. Do you see the next check? The knight can check him here. The bishop can check him here. This bishop can check him. The knight, the knight swings in and checks the king. You notice he has very few squares he can move to. He can't move here, here, or here. He can only move here. The rook is defended by the bishop. We have another check with the knight. The king runs to his only square. And now the trap has been set. Checkmate. The rook is defended by the bishop, and there are no escape squares for the king. All of this was possible because of the power moves that were present in the opening, because the bishop moved twice, and the king wasn't castled. These are features that Fisher saw and that you should look for in your games, and maybe you'll be able to launch the next game of the century.